Good afternoon. Welcome to Community and Technology, where we connect the global community with news, information, and resources that we hope will help improve your life. I'm Stu Reed. Here's my co-host, Dave Burstein. Hey, Dave. Hello. How are you? Not too bad. Uh-huh. Uh, I, 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 I almost had an invitation down to the White House. Almost, huh? What happened? Almost. Dave, this... My friend John Chaffee, Stanford professor, pretty much invented DSL 30 years ago, got a major award of Medal of Excellence or something the president gave them in the Oval Office. But they decided not to let press in because they had 15 people getting awards, all of whom were allowed to bring four people with them, which started mm. with, and John brought his family. Mm hmm uh, and suddenly there wasn't enough room in the Oval Office to let press in. Wow. Only two pools. So I didn't go down to Washington to see him getting that award. Uh, and I think these days I would pass a security tech test to go into the White House. But I certainly have had some things that the government didn't approve of in my life. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's hope there's some uh, expiration date on some of that stuff, huh, Dave? I haven't changed my politics in all those years, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I know there's a lot going on uh, in, in, in the world of technology. I know one of the areas that we wanted to get into was stuff happening in medicine. Uh, so that, that there's some breakthroughs uh in particular, I mean, the first thing that that uh, comes to mind is the, the story about uh, common meds leading to sudden cardiac arrest in type two diabetes people. What well, what's that about, Dave? Uh, this was a serious study, large. I think I, I think I got it out of nature. It looks solid, and it turns out that some standard antipsychotic drugs which are used very widely for lots of things, like Alzheimer's as well, mm -hmm. uh, triples your risk of sudden cardiac death. Triples the risk. Triples the risk. Wow. Now, this was in people 40 to 60 who don't have that many heart attacks, so tripling a very low rate is still a pretty low rate, mm -hmm. which is why it hadn't been picked up. But that's there. They also found two classes of antibiotics that double the risk. Wow. Antibiotics? Uh, yeah. They're not the common ones. Okay. They're, they're some of the heavy-duty ones they don't use very often. Again, that's was why they didn't know this. Mm -hmm. But definitely anybody taking antipsychotics or with people they know taking them should talk it over with their doctor. Mm -hmm. That that was a, that, that number startled me and most yeah doctors, that's, that that's a huge uh increase tripling your risk i mean that's 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 a frightening number well again it's tripling a very small number but it's significant remember 20 percent of the deaths in the united states and other developed countries are sudden cardiac deaths 20 percent. wow no i didn't know that one fifth that... without without symptoms wow and only 80% of the people who suddenly get a heart attack without expecting it mm -hmm. don't make it. Mm. They don't save that. They don't save that many, even with all the ambulances and CPR and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, yeah, it's still like that. There's another one that is really outrageous. Uh, we talked about this before the show. How many people do you think die every year? and tuberculosis, most of them young kids. Well, I know that in the States, it's been pretty much under control, but globally, uh, uh, I think it's a bigger number, but I don't really know. I mean, a uh, few hundred thousand, maybe? Right. 1.6 million. Whoa. It's, the lead, it's one of the key, leading causes of death in children. Mm. And it's been really hard to treat because there's been no vaccine that really worked. And it's very hard to cure, actually. Well, how do they get it under control in the States, Dave? I mean, I, I, I know you don't hear about it much here. Lots of ways. 
It t- you have to take medicines, usually two or three, for three to six months. Wow. And they're not cheap medicines. Mm-hmm. So you can realize when we're talking about, say, Cameroon, the chances of a young kid who doesn't have the money for the, whose family may not have the money for the bus to get him to the medical clinic. Mm-hmm. Taking medicine every day conscientiously for six months. Mm, not, not, not going to happen. Now, did, so didn't we get uh, vaccines for T for TB when we were kids, Dave? Didn't we get vaccinated as young people? Uh yeah, and that doesn't work so well. Mm. Uh so TB is still a major killer, as is malaria, uh, in Africa. And about six years ago, they seem to have come up, academic research, working with GlaxoSmithKline, the big drug company, Mm. vaccine that cut the rate in half. Mm. This should have been, assuming it worked, a big breakthrough. But what happened, stories from Popo Booker, they're, they're good reporters, it's solid, was that Glaxo decided that they weren't going to make money putting together a vaccine for poor kids in Africa. They would make more money doing things like a shingles vaccine that, among other things, I took and is a sensible thing for every every older adult to take. Uh, And they didn't go into human testing or this clinical trials needed for the vaccine. For the TB vaccine. With the TB vaccine, mm-hmm. they made. They're now starting it because Bill Gates's foundation is paying for the trials. Oh my goodness! So this but is what it, five, six years later after it was developed. Yeah. Now, until they had human trials, you wouldn't know whether it really had a fifty percent rate of prevention. Mm-hmm. But the 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 medicine it looks solid. This is what is wrong with losing track of what the public interest is when you're a corporation. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if they've lost track. I don't know that they ever had that on their radar, Dave. I mean, you say lose track. I don't think it's on their radar. I mean, profits are are such a compelling driver of corporate behavior. I, I don't know that public interest is even in the mix. Well, 20 years ago, it usually was. Mm-hmm. I say that because both AT&T and Verizon had large donation programs and loads and loads of community projects and art events and so on. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year because they figured we're a hundred billion dollar company. We have to give something back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what about Big Pharma, Dave? Big Pharma, I haven't seen them behave responsibly in that manner. Big Pharma, uh, and, and those are the ones that develop and market all of these drugs and potential cures. And I mean, th- they should be at the forefront of helping to make society healthier. You think so? But there have been too many stories like this. And well, I'm having a problem right now. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm diabetic. I take a medicine called Ozempic. Ozempic, beside being excellent on blood sugar, is one of the reasons I lost 100 pounds. It's Mm. a real hot thing. Every actor in Hollywood is taking it to keep their weight down, even Mm. though it costs $15,000 a year. Wow. Yeah, $1,000 plus a month. Mm. And my drugstore 10 days ago said, it's on back order. We can't get it for you. Now, I happen to find a way to get it, but they are taking ads to sell it for weight loss. And they don't have the capacity to keep up with the demand. And they charge oh, twice. Say that, say that again, Dave. I, I, you lost me. Well, okay. I think it's a diabetes medicine. You okay. Take it but they're selling it now, they're marketing as a weight loss drug? It's still marketed for diabetes. But not merely are they selling it for weight loss, which the FDA approved, and there's good reasons for a lot of people to lose a lot of weight, and it works. Mm -hmm. But they're taking TV ads. 
to promote it for weight loss, even though they don't have enough. In my drugstore, this is this, this has been known it's been a shortage situation for nine months uh, for people with diabetes. Wow. So, so the weight loss customers are overwhelming the diabetics that need it. Is that what's going on? Some, but the r really ridiculous thing is they're buying ads to try to sell more of it. Mm, that they don't have. <laughs> wow. And they say, and if you ask them, I'm sure they would say, well, we have this campaign. It's a long run campaign. We will be catching up. We said nine months ago we catch up in three months and when we we're a little bit behind we had some problems in the new plant blah 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 mm -hmm. uh this drug ozempic is so successful that it has totally changed the economic numbers for denmark which is where novo nordisk that makes it comes from mm -hmm. it turns out that they've sold so many billion dollars worth of this stuff that all the growth in the economy of Denmark was this drug being sold by one company. Wow. Wow. It's a thing. And they, they've got a patent, they've got a corner on this particular drug, I imagine. Well, they have a corner on this particular drug. However, there's another one also used for diabetes that's slightly different called Munjaro, may even be slightly more effective, that is now on the market about to be approved for weight loss and it's going to cut cut into the sales which presumably is why no is out and there are apparently 40 drugs in human testing some of whom are almost the same thing as those empic G glp1 antagonist are uh, that there will be loads of drugs kids will not be bullied because they're fat probably I remember what that was like. Mm -hmm. uh, and a whole lot of people will live longer because they're going to lose weight. And there are no, there are no side effects, Dave. I'm t I mean, I, I, I'm a layman and don't know about medicine and drug, but it's, I mean, a drug that's designed to treat diabetes that coincidentally causes or facilitates weight loss, there's no no downside to that if if, if you don't There's have diabetes downside, but it's not that serious okay well, a third of the people who take it for the first month and i was one of them uh have a real problem with nausea and vomiting and i still four or five times a year vomit unexpectedly mm. in it that's i certainly it's worth putting up with that in order to lose a hundred pounds, mm -hmm. uh, there are very few cases of pancreatitis and other serious stuff that are very rare. And frankly, think how many people were taking amphetamines to lose weight. Mm -hmm. That's a much more dangerous drug. Okay, but people were taking it. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. So that's right. Those are two medical stories. Mm -hmm. Be careful if you're taking antipsychotics. There is a tripled risk of sudden death when your heart fails. And remember that our system put aside for five or six years a drug that might probably would be saving hundreds of thousands of kids' lives every year as a vaccine for tuberculosis. That's mm. something wrong in the system. Now, why we're talking life and death. I thought about this pretty carefully. So I, I, I'm going to read out what I thought because I want to be very clear in what I'm saying. I'm Jewish and hope for the future of my people. The attack near Gaza was horrendous. It should be dealt with by all peaceful or defensive measures. But as a technologist, I know that weapons are and will continue to get deadlier. That means we must do whatever it takes to bring peace without mass killing of civilians. Because in the long run, they're going to come back afterwards. And 
I'm not going to change anybody's position on what's happening in Israel and Palestine right now. You're going to make up your own mind. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. But what I, where I do have the expertise is, well, uh, a U.S. general just said that in the end of this decade, one third of the soldiers out there are going to be robots. Mm. And I know people making those robots. Uh, and they're going to be brutally, uh, they're going to kill a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's not robots versus robots. It's robots versus people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so what I can tell you where I have expertise is that whatever it takes to find peace is going to be worth it. Yeah, I certainly agree with you, Dave. I mean, you know, I'm just reminded of... Uh the song from back in the 60s that I'm sure you remember by Edwin Starr called War. And the and the tagline was War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And it's it startled the world in the 1860s when the first war where they had inexpensive effective rifles happened. And a million people were killed in the American Civil War. Mm. Far more than were killed, for example, by weapons in uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. 30 years after that, you have the Sudan and you had the first use of machine guns in Bayou, wiping out the African defenders as Britain took command. Then you got to World War one. That was the trench warfare. Machine guns in huge volumes. Shells in huge volumes. Poison gas, in fact. And aerial bombing. Isn't that when aerial bombing began as well? There was some, but there wasn't that much of it. Remember, White Brothers were in 1903, and the, mm -hmm. that war was 1914 to 1918. Right. Yes, there were, there were some airplanes, but that wasn't what was doing the war. It was the machine guns and the pillboxes from the trenches, and it would be 40,000 dead in a day when Britain tried to move forward. Mm. That scared people. Mm. Of course, there was the atomic bomb in 1945. Yeah. 100,000 people in a day. Right. And what you were mentioning, massive civilian bombing, fire bombing of Dresden and so on. Uh, it's just going to get worse. And that's something that is a technologist. I am entitled to have an opinion on. Now, speaking of guns. What do you, a U.S. state senator just got arrested in Hong Kong for carrying a gun that got picked up at the Hong Kong airport. And he says, oh, I didn't realize it was in my bag. And a whole lot of Americans carry handguns in their, in, in their backpack routinely. And that's probably true. Jeff Wilson probably didn't realize the firearm was in his bag. The interesting thing about this is that that airplane took off in the United States and our screening didn't protect it. So the U.S. The, scanners didn't see it, Dave, on the U.S. end? The U.S. scanners didn't see it. They picked it up when he got to Hong Kong. Wow. And something that's been known among technologists for 20 years is the scanners don't work very well. They're mostly there for psychological reasons and to reassure people and for the politics, not because they have effectively preventing things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that's something wow. that technologists always knew. Wow. Now, you had one you wanted to talk about. Yeah, well, you know, there's stuff going on. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been talking about AI and, and language, and I know you have a, a footnote to this story, but uh, a piece ran last week about uh, Mayor Eric Adams here in New York City uh, putting out announcements in Spanish, Yiddish, and Mandarin in his own voice. 
come to find out, the mayor has not learned these languages, but there's an AI program that is able to translate uh, Mayor Adams's uh, voice into these other languages. And, and translate the words. It does two okay. things. It picks up what his voice is, and it does the translation and uses the voice it creates. Yes. To speak the translation, and the stuff really works. It's uh, it, it, it's it? stunning. Uh, um, I, mean, I, I don't know where this technology is going to go, but that you know, you and I can can be here talking on on the air on WHCR ninety point three in English, and the show could be translated in our voices into another language. Potentially. Not potentially. That's now happening every day in a fair amount of volume at the big music outfit, Spotify. Really? Wow. Has podcast. And they cut a deal with one of the air companies to take their podcast, some of them very popular and making a lot of money, and translate it into 11 languages and synthesize the voice of the original host speaking that language. This works. AI can now not just read the way you're typing things in, but it can hear, see, and speak really well. So much that, well, Joanna Stern at the Wall Street Journal picked up one of these synthesizers or programs that could synthesize her voice and her mother didn't realize it wasn't her speaking. Mm. It is that good, What whether it's right or wrong, whether it's going to be great that you can bring back Bert Lahr or Alec Guinness or any actor in the past, whether that's a good or a bad thing, whether you can have Barack Obama's voice saying in Spanish, I don't think mm -hmm. he does, uh, whatever, you want him to be saying in Spanish? Yeah. How about bringing back uh, 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 Martin Luther King or Malcolm X? That would be interesting. I would go further than that. They're already doing it. Not in Martin Luther King, as far as I know. But, for example, they're giving you the voice of people like Karl Marx. I don't know how they got that. He Karl Marx, really? Recording, I think. And you can talk to him and the computer will come back with an answer that is based on all the things that Karl Marx wrote and is very plausible, usually very reasonable and could fool most people if they didn't realize what was going on. Wow. Yeah, that's wow, that I can tell you because I've got the expertise that is practical and happening now. Mm. Wow. We have to take a break. Yeah, we're, we're going to take a break. Uh, and when we come back, I think uh, Jenny Boyd is going to come on. Is that right, Dave? Uh, don't have that this week. Oh, okay. We have this week is one of the podcast. It's one of the ones we taped with me explaining what all this AI stuff is. Okay, about. more AI tutorial from Dave Burstein when we come back. You're listening to Comedian Technology on WACR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Stay tuned. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me, yeah, it's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me, ooh, 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 ooh. and I'm feeling good. Fish in the sea, you know how I feel. River running free, you know how I feel. Blossom on the tree, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. 
It's a new day, it's a new life for me And I'm feeling good Dragonfly out in the sun, you know what I mean, don't you know? Butterflies all having fun, you know what I mean? Sleep in peace when day is done, that's what I mean And this old world is a new world and a bold world for me Stars, when you shine, you know how I feel Scent of the pine, you know how I feel It's a new day, it's a new Okay, uh, this is Stu Reed and Dave Burstein, and we're going through our Q&A on uh, some topics of interest. The first is AI. And Dave, I got I got to open up with what, what in the F is AI? What is it? Everybody's talking about it, but what is it? Experts in the world don't have a good answer to that. They disagree. It certainly is not a measure of intelligence. Why do I say that? Well, that couldn't be the definition because we can't say what intelligence is in humans either. It's a very vague term. There's emotional intelligence. There's situational awareness. Frankly, I remember back when, when I realized that, well, I tested really well on the standard intelligence test, things like SATs. But I wasn't that much smarter than the kid I played against on the basketball court who may not be very good in an SAT, but could watch me, watch my moves, and adjust to it. And that was a different kind of intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it meant that people who spent their time reading books like I did and answering teachers' questions we're going to score better in an SAT than somebody who spent mm -hmm. all their time. Yeah, and of course, it has to do with what, with what books you read and what kind of <laughs> curriculum your teachers are uh, uh, throwing at you. Um, you know, I mean, you and I w w w went to school, Dave, when there was a lot of uh, conversation, public conversation, about the bias built into the testing arena. And 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 we lived through a, a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion about the cultural biases that were built into testing. I, I don't know that it ever got improved, but I do know that many universities, including some of the leading universities that, and I think even that fancy one that you and I went to, are now throwing out SAT tests as a requirement or as a as as an indicator of success for prospective students. So, I mean, right there, that says something about the, the, the validity or lack thereof of tests. So that means the definition most people have, a computer thinking like a human being, doesn't mean very much because we don't really know how human beings think, although mm -hmm. we're getting better, better at it. So you get another kind of definition coming from uh, Stuart Russell, the Berkeley professor who wrote the standard textbook with Peter Northern, and it's a good textbook, even though it's now terribly out of date. It's four years old, and that means it's yes, ancient, ancient, ancient. <laughs> and this stuff, if you're three months behind, mm -hmm. you're not. 
and I can give you stories about that one, uh, said, had came up with a new definition having to do with an agent managed by a computer that interacts with the environment or something like that. And his whole, their definition of artificial intelligence has all to do with what the computer can do other than just sit back and answer questions. Mm -hmm. It can run a robot. It can go make your airline reservation and so on and so forth. Maybe that's a definition. But I can come up with equal experts with a half dozen other definitions. So there's only one definition that really I know is accurate to what's happening in the real world. Artificial intelligence is what's done by artificial intelligence experts. <laughs> okay. It, it is and what it is, huh? If the people who are doing artificial intelligence say it's artificial intelligence, it maybe is. Uh and artificial intelligence is far more than the showy things we've been hearing from ChatGPT, which can, for example, write a surprisingly good sketch for the plot of a reality show. Yeah, give a give a, a, just a basic primer, Dave. This is you know Q and A about AI. Give us a you know a thumbnail primer as to what it is and how it works. Okay, the most visible stuff that blew everybody away and just took away six months of my life from any other work, because I've been trying to understand it, is what's called generative AI. Uh, ChatGPT is generalized, pre-trained transformers. The thing there being that you can work with the data and come up with answers that the human being would not be able to. And as I say, Jenny had needed a script for a three minute preview of a reality show that they're working on. She was get, wasn't getting anywhere. I went to Claude, I think it was Claude I used, not ChatGPT, gave it a description of what she needed in the reality show, gave it to her to say, here's some ideas. She looked at it, made a few changes. The next day, showed it to a client who loved it. Mm. It's that good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you've got to know from the beginning, it gets all kinds of things wrong. And I just found again, first time I played with ChatGPT, I threw my own name into it. Mm -hmm. What happened? said I had written a book that I had never heard of. Oops. Oops. <laughs> and I have example after example. So you have to, and I can explain why those who, what we call hallucinations are happening and how they're trying to reduce them. But one of the first things you have to know is that it is not always accurate. Okay. But there's lots of other kinds of AI. And how does that work? You take a heck of a lot of data, billions of words, everything off the internet, everything in Wikipedia, hundreds of thousands of books like digitized by Google. You put them all together and you run them through fancy software with fancy mathematics that looks for patterns. And when it finds a pattern, it knows what's connected to what and what usually leads to what. And to the amazement, even of the people who made these large language models, as they were called, it really can come up with answers that people have no idea why, but very often are accurate. Mm -hmm. So the heart of the generative AI, and you can make you can make illustrations that are Photorealistic for real. So it's, make, it's not just it's not just words; it's narrative. It's also visual visualization that the uh, AI can do. And we'll show you another one. One of the stories we didn't get to in the show we just taped was voices. That there was a warning, I think, coming from the FBI, 
that deep fake voices are getting so good they're being used to scam the banks to mm. get money out of your account mm -hmm. that even somebody who knows you can't tell the difference between an ai generated voice and your own voice wow and in fact the wall street journal reporter just to prove the point digitized her voice put it through an ai program and fooled her own mother into thinking it was her, not the computer talking. Wow. Yeah. Now, that's really scary if you're an actor in Hollywood. They got your voice. They can reproduce it anytime they want. Yeah, wasn't well, that part of what the, the big uh, writer's strike is in Hollywood today about, Dave, is creative control of image and voice. Uh and what AI can do with it once uh, the studios get hold of it. And the right and wrong on that is, is worth the whole show and a discussion. But whether or not they can do that, that absolutely is being done every day. At this point, unless you're doing it really well, it's a little bit flat. Mm -hmm. But there have been scenes in some of the biggest movies that have been done using AI and computer graphics with an actor. In one case, the actor died in the middle of shooting and they needed him for a scene. They reproduced him using computer graphics so well that you didn't know which were the shots that he was actually in and which were synthesized. Wow. Now, it doesn't work well enough to do a whole movie yet. In fact, synthesizing video works for extras in a crowd scene, for example. And it can work pretty well for up to 15 seconds. But the video just isn't that good. But it's getting better. Yeah. The people mm. in Hollywood are absolutely right to know this is going to take a whole lot of it. Now, that's one kind of AI that finds patterns and generates answers. It's another kind of AI that solves problems. And probably the most significant piece of work done with artificial intelligence came from Google's DeepMind in, in London. There are about 200,000 uh, structures that we know is it proteins being generated. Yes, it must have been proteins being generated. Uh, that we know what the DNA sequence is that produces the protein. But that doesn't help you very much because proteins are three-dimensional. This fits into this over here and so on. And you need to know the three-dimensional diagram, three-dimensional mm. structure of protein. And that's been a really hard thing. It's traditionally something you gave to a graduate student to spend six months on to figure out. The uh, most famous case, of course, is when uh, first they figured out DNA itself and its structure. And then a few years after that, the Nobel Prize was won for figuring out the structure of hemoglobin produced from that DNA. Mm -hmm. That was worth a Nobel Prize because nobody had done a protein that complicated before. Uh, and some of that is really playing out now. You can, that hemoglobin, when mutated, gives you sickle cell disease. And one of the wonderful things that's happening in medicine today is most people with sickle cell disease can be cured with genetic engineering. It's can we happening cure with what, genetic engineering? Genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. It's happening in labs around the world and it's on the verge of becoming standard practice in medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's AI fuel, is it, Dave? Well, I actually don't know that particular one, but that's the power of knowing what the structure is mm -hmm. and what the DNA structure is. They identified what the mutation is. And there's several other, there's several cases like that. I don't know how they did it for sickle cell, but I know they're doing it with things like cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. They're curing 
Mm-hmm. Sherry scripts in the telephones and all of that. They're curing muscular dystrophy. How? Well, they figured the structure of the protein, which is called, called dystrophin, and looked to see what was mutated and what the problem was. And then they looked at the structure of chemicals that might fix problem in the form of an injection or a pill. That is now so common in medicine, such standard practice, that the big controversy is how do you pay for it? You save one half a million dollars for each patient. Half a million dollars for what? Each patient cured. Whoa, per patient, each patient? Wow, that's crazy. Okay, but that's one of the things that's happening And now they're able to do the structure of proteins for drugs. DeepMind came up with about 90% of the structures of the 200,000 proteins known to science and is being used all over the world two years later to design new drugs. One of them just got into human trials. Dozens, probably hundreds, are currently in lab trials in the test tube and in animals. And they're going to be dozens in human trials in the next year or three. Because AI is able to figure out the structure, look at where there's a defect in that structure, look at designing a drug that can cure that defect, and do that all Mm. without you can test to. Yeah, so AI is having a huge impact in medicine and healthcare, in the creative arts, in 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 uh, visual arts. Uh, what, what else? I, I know it's having an impact also in uh, you know we talked about self driving cars not too long ago, and the something that just got approved in San Francisco recently, and it's 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 being used there too, is it not? It's being used in a very limited way. As I say, this stuff makes mistakes. A lot of them, unless you really, really put a thousand engineers working for five years to be able to do a small part of the city of Phoenix or San Francisco. Mapping out San Francisco literally centimeter by centimeter where there's problems in the road. Driving millions of miles, some simulated, but many with the driver in the car, seeing what happens when somebody goes, opens the door in a car ahead of you, mm-hmm. or a bicycle pulls around a bus and making sure the AI is trained to deal with it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work perfectly. They now are allowing Google and General Motors crews to actually run driverless taxi cabs across parts of San Francisco. Mm. It took years and dozens, if not hundreds of engineers just to do part of San Francisco Mm -hmm. and map it well. Wow. So where is all this going, Dave? What's your sense? Of where I where I, AI is going to go over the next five ten years, uh, is it really going to change things uh, in a fundamental way? Yes, mm-hmm. but not nearly as much as the hype. We just talked about some incredible things it's doing, mm-hmm. but the hype is so great it couldn't possibly do a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And if we have music to play. In between this and another segment, do you remember Public Enemy? Sure. What's this? What's the key song? Mm. Don't believe the hype. All right. Don't believe. Thank you. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. Coming up. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> and we'll use that for our next musical break. Okay. This has been Community Technology Day, Burstein and Stu Reed with a bit of a reprise and tutorial on AI. Stay tuned. We'll be back for more. Community Technology on WHCR 90.3 FM. Here's what I want you all to do for me. Bang! 
you looking for the same thing It's a new thing, check out this I bring Uh oh, the roll below the level Cause I'm living low next to the base Come on! Turn up the radio They're claiming I'm a criminal But now I wonder how Some people never know The enemy could be the friend guardian I'm now a hooligan I rock the party and clear all the madness I'm not a racist, preach the teach the all Cause don't they never had this? Number one, never wanna run about the gun I wasn't licensed to have one The minute they see me, fear me I'm the epitome, a public enemy Used, abused, without clues I refuse to blow a fuse They even had it on the news Don't believe the hype Don't, 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 don't believe the hype Was the start of my last jam, so here it is again, another death jam. But since I gave you all a little something that I knew you lacked, they still consider me a new jack. All the critics you can hang on my hold the rope, but they hope to the Pope and pray it ain't dope. The follower of Farrakhan, don't tell me that you understand until you hear the man. The book up the new school rap game, writers treat me like Coltrane, insane. Yes to them, but to me, I'm a different kind. We're brothers of the same mind, I'm blind Caught in the middle end, not surrendering I don't rhyme for the sake of riddling So claiming that I'm a smuggler Some say I never heard of ya A rap burglar, false media We don't need it, do we? It's fake, that's what it be to you, dig me? Yo, Terminator X, step up on the stand And show these people what time it is, boy Don't, 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 don't believe the hype As an equal, can I get this through to you? My 98 booming with a trunk of funk All the jealous punks can't stop the dunk Coming from the school of hard knocks Some perpetrate, they drink Clorox Attack the black because I know they lack exact The cold facts and still they try to Xerox The leader of the new school, uncool Never played the fool, just made the rules Remember there's a need to get alarm Again I said I was a time bomb in the daytime, radio scared of me, cause I'm mad, plus I'm the enemy They can't come on and play me in prime time, cause I know the time, plus I'm getting mine I get on the mix late in the night, they know I'm living right, so here goes the mic sight Before I let it go, don't rush my show, you try to reach and grab and get elbow Word to her, yo, if you can't swing this, learn the words You might sing this, just a little bit of the taste of the bass for you As you get up and dance at the LQ with some denial the fight, I swing polos, then then they clear the lane, I go solo, the meaning of all the that the media is the whack, as you believe it's true, it blows me through the roof, suckers, liars, give me a shovel, some writers I know are damn devils, from them I say don't believe the hype, yo Chuck, they must be on the pipe, right, their pens and pads I snatch cause I've had it, I'm not an addict, fiend it for static, I see their tape recorder and I grab it, no you can't have it back, silly rabbit, I'm going to my media assassin, Harry Allen, I gotta ask him. Yo, Harry, you're a writer, are we that tight? Don't believe the hype. Okay, we're back. Community Technology Day bursting to read, and we are kicking around AI, and uh, Dave has been uh, really studying this issue for uh, a good six months in depth. So we're picking his brain. So, so Dave, uh, can AI really read minds? Absolutely. Whoa, how's that work? Get no, out of here. It. But it's actually out there getting into use in the laboratory routinely and going to be getting out there even more in the next few years. The most dramatic example is a woman who's been locked in mute after a stroke for 18 years couldn't read anything, move her head a little, and you could use that to interpret what she wanted to say. So she was able to communicate that she was a perfect test subject. They put into her brain some very thin electrodes and started measuring the signals in her brain. An EEG, well, a much improved EEG, and it created an enormous amount of data. And they had her think about particular words. 
So they would tell her, think about dog, think about cat, think baseball, think Toronto Blue Jays, and see the pattern of her brain waves in enormous detail, an enormous number of samples. She spent, I think, a few months in the lab training the system. Mm -hmm. But what there now is, video you can see on the internet, is that this woman, who after 18 years hadn't been able to speak, could now talk to her husband. He asked her, and we have this on video. Wow. I didn't think of the prospects of the Toronto Blue Jane Jays this, this season. She said, who would be anything? <laughs> wow. So yeah, then, look, 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 let, me, let me just reprise what you just said and make sure I understand it. Essentially, the AI uh, uh, platform learned what the brain patterns were for this woman by giving her prompts. Think about this read the brain pattern. Think about that, read the brain pattern. Think about this, another brain pattern. So then it synthesizes all these brain patterns, correlates with what the instructions were. And now the woman can think, that is have a brain pattern and the algorithm knows what it is and can actually synthesize the voice. That's the other piece. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they also had some voice samples of her before she had her stroke. Is that right, Dave? And they were able to therefore use that to synthesize a voice for her? I think it was a video made at her wedding of 15 minutes. Wow, okay. The synthesizers are working so well that they're worried about it in the banks that people can synthesize your voice and get your information that they're mm -hmm. not supposed to know. And a Wall Street Journal reporter, Joanna Stern, had her voice synthesized by one of these programs and fooled her own mother. Mm. Some things work that well. Voice synthesis is there. Telling a dog from a cat is there. Predicting things like what she's what word is she thinking? Not so perfect. Mm -hmm. In fact, in this example I gave with a woman who had been mute for 18 years. It missed about one in four words. So she was able to have a conversation, but the AI didn't get all her words yet. Mm -hmm. It made it better because the way AI works is you use it and you see what was right, what was wrong, feed that in and improve the model. Mm -hmm. Almost every, every, if you turn around and say, oh, this illustration program, it doesn't quite come up with the quality of a photo, which is what you could say four or five months ago. But all the people using it to make an illustration like a photo and rejecting the ones that weren't good enough, accepting the ones that did it right, that gave the information to feed back into the system and improve it. Mm -hmm. so it gets better and better. Now, right Dave, now. I, I want to ask you, that kind of just triggered in my mind the, the whole thing that we've heard about deep fakes. What's a deep fake and how does AI play into that? Well, Elvis lives. Or a simulation of Elvis, the one that they're actually doing, mm -hmm. Jimmy Dean, the actor, can be so good that you can't tell the simulation from the original. Mm. In fact, it can go further like that. You feed the a dozen Jimmy Dean movies and every piece of footage you have of him, and the computer will look for patterns, how he moves, how his mouth changes, how his head moves as he's talking, how he walks, and find the patterns that are Jimmy Dean and then give a performance in the style of Jimmy Dean. It works pretty well, although it takes a lot of work to get it right. Okay, there. to be continued. This has been Community and Technology with Dave Burstein and Stu Reed, where we kicked around AI. 
uh, brief tutorial and look at where it is and where it's going. Stay tuned. WHR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. Thank you.